Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I am going to be sharing with you my recent presentation that I presented at the Global Sources Summit, only that I did it again and recorded it especially for my YouTube channel. So you're in for a treat. This is a long video, but well, well worth it. I believe that everything has changed when it comes to product research. I think that supply chain being so broken has a major impact on the way that we should be looking at uh, products. And also many things have changed in the last couple of years, but specifically in the last two years as well. So I'm going to be including in this video timestamps so that you can skip to a specific subject that interests you. But I do highly recommend that you find time to watch this video from A to Z from the very beginning until the very end so that you um, can really be informed about everything that's going on. So this is a product research for 2022 video. This is mainly focused on how to find your next niche and how to then build a brand around your niche. But the first half of the video is focused on all the different changes that have happened in the supply chain world and how that's impacted the way that we all sell on Amazon today and how we look at products. If you are new here, my name is Sharon Evan and I am an Amazon FBA seller. I'm also a podcaster, YouTuber, Amazon FBA mentor, public speaker, and I think that's about it. I'm also a mother and a wife and an entrepreneur. That's enough. Anyway, if you are new here, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're interested in e-commerce, product development, sourcing, Amazon FBA, all that awesome stuff. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and also hit that like button if you liked this video. And don't forget to hit that no notification bell so you know when I bring out more videos as well. Just before we get started, if you don't know, I also have an in-depth product research and sourcing course focused solely on how to find products, how to do in-depth product analysis, competitor analysis, market analysis, how to then go and develop those products, source them, how to find the right manufacturer for your product and how to then ship your product correctly to Amazon. Focus mostly on that. So if you are looking for your next product, I highly recommend that you consider joining the course. We also meet weekly there and have weekly group Zoom calls and it's just like a small family in there. So I encourage you to join. All right, without further ado, let's get into the video. Okay, we are now inside of my computer um, and we're going to start. So this is my presentation that I recently presented at Global Sources and today I'm going to be making a video for you guys for it. So let's start. Product research in 2022, how to find your niche and build a brand. So I believe that the way to go, look, I've always believed in this. It's not that I think anything has changed. Um, I just think it's even more important today. I believe that the way to go today is if you're looking to sell physical products, it's to build a brand, especially if you're looking to sell on Amazon. I believe that Amazon no longer really wants people to just sell random shit online. They're not looking for, um, for search term pages, for search pages to turn into like a price war situation. They don't want the same product, you know, and, and sold by many different random sellers. That is what helped them to become Amazon. But I think that they've changed the direction in which they're going. And that's evidential if you look at the amount of perks and the amount of benefits you get today when you have a brand. So once your brand registered, which means that you've actually gone and had a trademark done, etc., um, you have all these different benefits, which I have a YouTube video about all the different benefits that brand um, that being brand registered gives you on uh, Amazon, all the different benefits give you, it gives you. So I believe that that is the way to go, that the way to go is to see how you can get into a niche where you can dominate within that niche and build a brand around that niche and towards probably halfway through in the presentation, I will be showing you um, an example of how we do that. All right, let's start. All right, the topics that we'll be discussing today will be one, uh, for or A, what has changed? So how has COVID 
basically I'm going to blame a lot on COVID here. How has it caused us all to need to consistently adjust um, and what has changed, what we must be doing today in order to survive on Amazon, in my opinion, why niching down and becoming a shark in a small pond, in my opinion, is better than being a small fish in a large pond. Um, niching down what the process looks like when I speak about niching down so we understand what I mean, how to find your starting points. So how do you even come up with starting points for product research, a quick intro into Amazon's new product opportunity explorer tool. Um, I have an entire YouTube video about how to use the uh, product opportunity explorer tool. And I also did a podcast on it on the seller sessions podcast as well. So if you want to see that tutorial, uh, you can find that on my channel. Um, an example of what niching down actually looks like. And one of my current methods for product research, which is my favorite method for product research right now. All right, let's begin. So a lot has changed. Um, COVID has impacted the world in many, many different ways for the e-commerce world. On the one hand, it has caused a lot more demand. So even more demand. I mean, my 85 year old grandfather is, is buying online right now as well. I had to teach him how to um, do his, um, his shopping online. And on the other hand, it's caused a lot of adapting and adjusting for e-commerce business owners um, and the way that we run our businesses. So before this, many of you may have never really used a 3PL before. You maybe didn't know A to Z about the manufacturing processes. In my opinion today, you can't get away without you know those things today because you have to know a lot more about, you need to be a lot more hands-on as well with running your business today. Worldwide e-commerce has seen a large increase in sales, including Amazon worldwide markets. We can see here an image for retail e-commerce sales worldwide, um, both predictions and actuals um, from insiderintelligence.com. So on the one hand, there has been a lot more demand for products online and e-commerce in general and retail e-commerce in general. Um, but on the other hand, a lot has changed when it comes to uh, supply chain. And also a lot has changed when it comes to Amazon. And there's many, many more things that we need to either know about or take into consideration before we even think about product research. So the first thing is supply chain is just chaotic right now. It has been for the last year. Supply chain is completely broken um, and it's it's tough. I've spoken about it a lot over the last year. The entire supply chain industry is broken. This includes trucking, shipping, 3PLs, issues at ports, etc. Um, broken manufacturing. So the manufacturing world also is broken right now. We've got, I'm speaking obviously specifically in China right now. Um, it's not that other countries manufacturing isn't uh, tough, it still is. But part of the fact that many of us have now looked at outside of China for manufacturing at all also means that something must be broken. So there's crazy increase in lead time, um, increase in raw material cost, there's increase in labor cost, um, the exchange rate, obviously, all of these things. So a product that you um, may have been sourcing, let's just say two years ago, may have taken a month to make. And today the lead time for it could take three months, right? I mean, obviously it's extremely product uh, product dependent, but if that happens, it means that you need a lot more money up front because you need a lot more cash flow because you're buying a lot more stock up front. Um, restock limits on Amazon. So Amazon has been changing their inventory limits without warning. Right. So first they change the fact that if you are um, bringing a new product into Amazon, you can only have 200 units and then they changed it and they've made the limits on an account level. And who knows, they could change it tomorrow to something else and they give you no warning. So we need to we've all need to, needed to adjust and to work with 3PLs and rely less just on Amazon, especially for warehousing. Um, Another thing that has changed is that Amazon, like I said earlier, is rewarding brands a lot more. So Amazon is giving a lot more features to brand registered sellers and products connected to a brand that is registered. Um, so the impacts that this has, it means that so with the chaotic supply chain, it means that uh, we need to do a lot more or much better inv inventory optimization. Uh, so for example, because shipping is so broken right now, you need to learn a lot more than what you used to have to 
about the way that you optimize your cartons, right? Or the way that um, you handle your inventory. Out of stock issues, there's been so many people and products that are out of stock. Obviously, you know, the um, LA port is, I think, the, the worst congestion that it's ever had. Um, I think there was like a hundred and something ports, a uh, hundred and something boats parked <laughs> there at some stage. So the out of stock issues as well is, is crazy. More cost to factor in because you may need to purchase a lot more units up front and then your units may be stuck on in um, on a boat for a lot longer up front. It means that you will need more money because you're buying um, more stock ahead of time where maybe pre this whole chaos, you could have gotten away with um, purchasing half the stock up front. So things to take into consideration. Broken manufacturing, so it means that you'll need larger orders or closer sourcing. What I mean by clo closer sourcing is over the last year, there have been a lot of ups and down downs with China. Um, for exa example, um, obviously China has had uh, um, beyond COVID issues, they've also had electricity issues where um, there have been still to date <laughs> at the time of filming this, there have been um, different factories or different areas in China where they have, uh, by law, they've needed to use less electricity. So some suppliers in China, some factories either went out and bought a generator or they're only suddenly working two days a week because the rest of the week they don't have a, have electricity. Um, I made a whole entire show about that on the Seller Sessions podcast. I'm not going to go into that now. But a lot of people have realized that we can't only depend on one country for our manufacturing because if something suddenly happens with that one country, then that's you know our product gone because or we need a lot more time to start to look for other places to source. That's A and B. Another reason why people are looking to source closer is because of the amount of time it now takes to get products from China and how much it costs to get products from China all the way to the US if you sell in the US, even in Europe as well. So a lot more people have looked at countries that are closer, for example, Mexico or even sourcing the US, etc. Um, manufacturing, so the impact of this broken manufacture means that uh, everything costs more basically, um, and you need to do much smarter sourcing and not rely only on China, which we just spoke about. The restock limits, the impact that has is that we all really need to start using 3PLs, and it means we also need to prioritize products. So at the time of making this video, Amazon's um, inventory limits or restock limits are on a account level, meaning you're, you'll be told, let's just say that you can have 10,000 units for your entire account. And then you need to prioritize how many units you're bringing in for what product, which makes it difficult to bring new products in because you don't want it to um, you know, impact your older products. So that has also had an impact on many sellers. And then um, the rewarding the brands, it means that you really need to focus on brand building. So that are some things that have changed and the impact that that has on the way that we all look at sourcing products today, which obviously impacts the way that we do product research. Something else that has changed a lot um, since, you know, in the last at least year, it's become like the new thing now to buy Amazon product based businesses. There are many, 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 many aggregators today out there. Um, which is great on the one hand, if you're looking to exit your business. And on the other hand, it means that we no longer may be just dealing with, you know, regular day competitors. You may be one of your biggest competitors may have been bought out by a huge aggregator with lots and lots of money behind them for marketing. And that's something that we also need to take into consideration, which is why I think it's even more important to start thinking about also getting into niches rather than trying to sell, you know, pretty saturated products. So what will product research look like in 2022? So A, we're going to need a lot more cash flow. OK, you need a lot more money today in order to start selling online or in order to sell online or in order to sell products in general than what you may have needed a year or two ago. Um, you need to understand sourcing, smarter sourcing. So like I said in the beginning, 
You may have been able to get away with the way that you source your products. You may have been able to get away with not really understanding the manufacturing that goes into your product. Today, you can't do that. You really, really need to know the ins and outs of the way that your product is made so that you can make better decisions for your products. So for example, if your product is made out of one type of material, well, if you learn a little bit more about that product and you change the material to a different type of material, and then that means that you can source from India or Vietnam, for example, that could either reduce your your costs or give you better quality or you know have some sort of impact on your manufacturing. Or if you understand the way that your product is made from A to Z, you may be able to speed up the manufacturing process by doing something, right? Which could bring down your lead time or whatever it is. You just need to know a lot more than what you may have needed to know when I started in 2016. I, I actually have been sourcing since I was 15, but I started selling on Amazon in 2016. So sourcing has been my thing, um, especially also from China from a really, really young age. And I've been managing to do it all online. So um, I definitely understand when it comes to, to smart sourcing. And I think that it's something that you all need to understand today as well when you're looking into bringing products. Better differentiation. So on my YouTube channel, I always talk about how important differentiation is. Crucial. Um, in order to bring products out today, you really need to have a great differentiation point. Um, and today I think it's like, it's it's not, it, it's just a must now. It's not something that maybe two or three years ago was, oh, you should, you know, you should differentiate. It's, it's like, if you don't differentiate today, you're gonna die right? Or your business will die. So definitely a must. COVID-19 has taught us that diversification is important and that we don't put all our eggs in one basket. So what do I mean by that? I mean, A, that we should not be only sourcing from one country, but B, we should also not be trying to sell only on Amazon. I don't consider myself just an Amazon seller. I consider myself you know, someone that has multiple brands. I'm a brand builder. I am an e-commerce seller, basically. Um, I don't think that you should only be selling your products on Amazon. I think Amazon should be your entry point, the, the place where you learn initially, that where you start, and then slowly you learn more and more about other marketplaces that fit your brand, um, and you get into that, or you sell on your own website as well. And I obviously that also means don't put all your eggs in one basket on a manufacturing level, but diversification diversification is crucial uh, in life and in business. So we need to diversify our sourcing. Okay, if uh, we source from China, that's fine, but maybe we should also look at sourcing from Turkey, U.S., Mexico, Korea, etc., Thailand start looking at other countries that may make sense for your product as well. Obviously it depends on your product and that's why understanding your manufacturing is important. Diversify your marketing. So if back in the day we only looked at, um, let's just say Amazon PPC only, which you know I consider myself someone who's pretty savvy when it comes to Amazon PPC, look at also um, marketing your product outside of Amazon. So in a world where social media is so important, Wanting to make sure that your product is social media worthy, in my opinion, is something that is crucial because it's a big. It'll be a big differentiation between the Amazon sellers and people that just focus on Amazon and the people that are also actually brand building, building brands, and able to find where their buyer avatar avatars hang out and marketing the products to them. We wanna diversify our product uh, catalog as well, so brand building focus rather than product focus. So you'll see soon when we get into uh, a specific niche and how I found this idea, um, that my mind is always thinking about how I can build a brand and not how I just can sell a product. Yes, it starts with a product, but my mind is always thinking about the bigger picture and how I can, by focusing on the buyer avatar, the type of person that buys their product, how I can already think about how I can sell them more products. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the problem. <laughs> the problem is that most sellers look for products through softwares, which results in people ending up with the same types of product ideas. Um, I don't use softwares at all 
for product research, I use softwares in order to do uh, market analysis and um, competitor analysis and keyword analysis, but I do not use softwares to find products. Parameters, most sellers enter the same type of parameters into the software. So most people will go into something like Helium 10 or Jungle Scout. They'll put in, you know, the, looking for a product with this amount, of, so, this amount of search volume, this size, this price. And then we're all seeing the same type of products. No, that's not how I do. Never have. You won't see any tutorials on my YouTube channel with this. You'll never hear me using this as, um, as a product research method from, the, from day one. I've never done this. I've always had creative ways of how I've found products. And that's what we're going to get into really soon as well. Differentiation. Most sellers do not realize the importance of differentiation and branding. Algorithm focus. Most sellers are focused on um, the algorithm. They're just focused on how to get a product ranked without or just how they're focused on numbers only, which is crucial. It's important, but it's not the only important thing. If you're only focused on the numbers and on the algorithm or how to trick the algorithm or whatever it may be, you may be forgetting for a second that, wait a minute, you're selling to an actual person, to an actual human, and your product actually needs to be appealing to them, right? It's great if you know how to get your product ranked, but in the first place, make sure you've actually got a product that people want to buy, right? So that's part of the problem. Um, so I'm now going to move on to speaking about how we can find our niche. How can you find your niche? So first of all, let's start with what is a niche. When you hear me saying on my YouTube channel or on seller sessions, many times the words niching down, what do I mean? So in, in my experience or in my opinion, what niching down means is a, you start with a category. Okay. So the category you under within that category, you then have a niche. And within that niche, you could then have a sub niche. And within that sub niche, you could then have a micro niche. So an example would be, for example, fitness. Okay, fitness, that could be the category. And then the niche could be yoga. And then the sub niche could be kids yoga. And then the micro niche could be yoga for little girls or kids yoga mats or whatever it may be. Okay, so when I talk about niching down, you'll see that I obviously there is a category, but I'm focusing on a very specific niche within that category, whether it be a very specific type of product or whether it be a very specific type of buyer avatar, I'm focusing on something very, very specific. Which basically what I'm looking to become is this is my goal. Okay, this is my terrible Photoshop skills. <laughs> um, this is my goal. My goal is to not be like everyone. Many people are looking to just be a small fish in a large pond. I want to be a large, big, fat shark in a small um, in, in a small pond. So what I mean by that is many people will just try and find how they can differentiate a product that may be quite saturated. And I'm looking at, well, well, what can I focus on with, even if it is a saturated c category, what kind of niche can I find in this subcategory or in this category? So looking for a niche or a sub niche, who can I focus on? And then how can I dominate within that specific niche? That's my goal, being my goal from day one. If you look at any content I've ever made from the beginning of me making content to date, this has always been my thing. It's not that it suddenly changed because COVID happened. I've always spoken about niching down because all my brands are very niche based. What does my niche process look like? So it basically looks like this. You find a category or a product. You brainstorm, who can you sell this product to? You start doing these three steps more or less at the same time. So it's not that one comes before the other, but we start doing keyword research and then market and niche analysis, competitor analysis, and we look how we can differentiate the product. Obviously, one of the most important things is also understanding how to source that product. Sourcing goes hand in hand with product research. But um, that is something that I'm not going to focus on in this specific um, presentation. I'm focusing more on the product research side of things. So for me, when it comes to the way that I do product research, it all comes down to starting points, right? I need to be able to start somewhere. Um, so my starting points are usually three different things. One, 
either a product. So I found a product and I asked myself, well, can I focus on a specific niche for this product or a specific buyer avatar within this product? Two, I found a category and uh, a broader category and I'm trying to see how I can find a way to niche it down. Or three, I've found a specific buyer avatar and I'm looking at what kind of products I can sell to this buyer avatar. So let's talk about the first one, which is I found a product and I'm seeing if I can focus on a specific niche. Um, so the questions that I would ask myself is, is there a gap within this market? Can I repurpose this product? So can I take this product that is being sold to this type of buyer, but sell it to a different type of buyer? Um, can you focus on a specific buyer avatar? So um, for example, I'm just going to take something from the top of my head. If it's a water bottle, can I create a water bottle specifically for pregnant women? Okay. As an example, um, you want to focus on specific, but not too specific so that no one's going to even find your product because no one's looking for it. So you want to see if you have the ability for this product to focus on a buyer avatar, but don't get too specific. Can a slight change be made um, uh, that makes it very niche? And can it be bundled to make it a better offer? Sometimes you can take this product, understand what the buyer avatar needs and other products that they buy, create a bundle, and that's your differentiation. Okay, so those are the types of things I will ask myself, and this is what the research process could look like. So let's just say I found a product and the product is, for example, a cutting board. Okay, can I niche it down for mini cutting boards for kids? Okay, so a lot of people that do cooking with their kids, can I focus on that specific niche or that specific product? And then that also opens up my mind to a broader um, uh, niche, which is kids cooking, for example. If I'm looking at, let's just say, a blanket, well, can I focus on a very specific blanket? So a blanket's for, I'd make a niche. Well, who, what kind of blankets do people need? So for example, blankets for people in hospital, right? Hospitals are always cold. If you think about it, it doesn't matter if it's warm or cold outside, inside it's always cold. So can I make a specific blanket for people in the hospital, for example? Okay, so blankets may be saturated, but if I niche it down to a very specific type of blanket, that may not be as saturated. Okay, yoga mats. If you were to talk to anyone about a yoga mat, they'd be like, dude, that's so saturated. But a year ago, before I started talking about this, right, I've spoken about this in many events, uh, and I've seen that there's been a lot, I'm not saying that I'm not taking credit for it or anything, I'm not saying it's my fault. I'm just saying that I've spoken about this very often in the last year and a half. If you would have spoken, uh, looked at anyone that understands Amazon uh, about yoga mats, they would have told you, how oh, it's way too saturated. But if you would have looked into sub-niching, if you would have made a list about all the different people that use yoga mats, you would have been like, hey, wait a minute, there's also kids. And there was a lot of search volume around kids yoga. And when people were typing in kids yoga mats, all you would see on Amazon were adult, kid, uh, adult yoga mats, not kids. And the only reason that those yoga mats were showing up was because there was no other option, so people were buying adult ones. And then the, this entire niche was created around kids' yoga mats. So um, if your starting point is a product, seeing how you can focus on a specific buyer avatar or niching down within that product can be a great way to find your next brand or your next product. Category, so how do we, how, what does a research process look like when we have found a category? So you found a category, a potential category, and now you're looking to sub-niche. So for example, let's just say that the category is decor. You know that you wanna do some sort of decor product, you make a list of potential things that you can do, and you decide you're gonna get into outdoor decor and sp focus specifically on gardening and then or garden, and then you're gonna sp focus specifically on tree decor, for example or you're going to look at the category bridal showers, um, gifts, for, gifts for bridesmaid, and you're going to focus specifically on bridesmaid proposal gifts, okay? Which could lead you also into groomsman proposal gifts or flower girl proposal gifts. So starting with a larger category, a lot of people will say, well, this is already saturated because they don't think about how they can niche it down. And then the last one, which is one of my favorite ways, is to your starting point to be a buyer avatar. <clears throat> so for example, let's just say teachers. So teachers supplies or specifically PE teachers, right? PE teachers need physical education teachers. They need all sorts of supplies. 
Okay, uh, another buyer avatar, so your starting point could be gifts for women, so women, but what kind of women? They could be divorced women. And then it could be funny gifts for divorced women where you could get ideas from things like Pinterest, Google, etc. This is actually a thing, like what I'm showing you are actually things that people are searching for. If you were to look at gifts for divorced women, that's like an entire niche on Amazon. You could create heaps of different types of products for women who are divorced, right? Um, you may have heard me speak about this many, many times. I always give the example of nurses. Nurses in America, they need to uh, take, they need to source all their own supplies. So their stethoscope and their stethoscope case and their bag and their scrubs and even down to like their markers, they need to to buy all their own supplies. So there are so many keywords around nursing pro like products for nurses on uh, Amazon as well. So I found that by looking up different types of buyer avatars that I could start with. So it was actually through careers. I went to Google, I typed in different careers, and I found that uh, teachers and nurses and all sorts of different types of, of um, uh, buyer avatars, and that's how I learned that about nurses. So we spoke about three different starting points. One is a product, two is a category, or three is a buyer avatar. So how do we even find these starting points? So I have a product research and sourcing course. Within that course, every four to six weeks, we do product research marathons. This is an example of what the worksheet looks like. So I send out a worksheet and I give people um, this worksheet for them to fill out. The red is me filling out my own my own answers to these questions. And then this gives us a starting point for that specific marathon. Nothing is done in advance. We do it, all the product research live on that marathon. And the purpose of running those marathons is not for me to find people products, but rather for people to see the process of product research being done live. And not that I already found a product in advance and I'm faking it live now, like it's all legit done live. So this is an example of some questions that I ask and I thought that I'd show you guys here. So an example of the last questionnaire was make a list of hobbies, things that your children or your partner or your siblings love. So you can see that my answer was Pokemon, Lego, ninjas, and watches. <laughs> my son's really into Pokemon and Legos and ninjas and my husband's into watches. Life-changing experience that you've gone through. And by the way, this may sound funny to you, but people need Pokemon storage, right? They need albums for their Pokemon cards and they need all sorts of different storage cases for their Legos. And there's all these different niches around Lego display. Um, and same thing with ninjas and watches. There are niches within these, these examples that I've put in here. Life-changing experience that I've gone through or milestones that I've gone through. So you would be asking yourself these questions. Obviously, this is a lot longer. This is just a few of the questions, but this is how you come up with starting points. So for example, pregnancy, sickness, birth, a dream job, becoming a parent, losing a loved one, losing a business. These things could be part of your starting points. So for example, um, not the, the nicest thing to speak about, but it's, you know, it's part of life today. For example, if you have had cancer or someone close to you has had cancer, you may look into making products for cancer patients. If you were to go onto Amazon and you were to look at the, around, the amount of search volume around you know, um, gifts for women with breast cancer, gifts for any type of different cancer, you'll see there's like hundreds and thousands or tens of thousands of searches around that. And if you have been on that other side, then you know exactly what type of products you would want to receive. Okay, if you've given birth, so I, one of my uh, brands is a postpartum brand. I, after giving birth, I went through something very specific, which, which introduced an entire niche of stuff that I wouldn't have known had I not gone through this. And I created a brand around that. Maybe your dream job, you did something <laughs> once, um, and there are certain products that whatever that, so if you're like a DJ or you were a DJ, maybe there are certain products that specifically DJs need, or maybe becoming a parent has opened your mind up or your eyes up into a very specific niche. And there's a starting point there. Weird things that you loved ones, uh, or that you love. This one always gets people laughing, but I found so many niches from doing this. So here are my answers for, for example, all things owls. I have a thing for owls. If you guys see here, 
This is a little owl. My entire office is full of owls. My house is full of owls. I love owls. And it's because my husband says that I look like an owl. And if you were to look on Amazon, there is an actual search. There's actually people searching for owl decor, which involves taking a simple product and putting owls on it. And it's now owl decor. So I could have built a brand around owl decor, for example. Um, if you know me, I love all things stationary. Anything to do with cute stationary stuff, I love. Okay, adult Lego, Lego, superheroes, all things cute. Remember that because it's going to be a part of the few, the next few slides that we speak about. Um, my mom has a thing for shoes. I have a thing for huskies. I drink way more water than normal people. Okay, jobs that you've had in the last years or that your loved ones have had. So my mom works with seniors. My sister is a DJ. My husband owned a restaurant. My dad has a driving school. My stepdad has a helicopter business. All of these things could have been starting points for me for finding my next brand or finding my next product. Favorite hobbies or things that you love to do. So kickboxing, building Lego, reading, singing, music, hanging out with my son, anything entrepreneurial, dates with my husband. Everything that I've answered here, and I encourage you to go and make your own list, everything that I've answered here has given me a starting point to then go down a rabbit hole and see what kind of niches I can find within that. Um, and then on the left hand side, you can see that in the last marathon, I asked people to make a list of either their hobbies or decor styles or niches that they love and to join a whole bunch of Facebook groups around that specific starting point. And I get, and you'll understand why very shortly. So I gave some examples. So for example, let's just say that one of my, my things was like kid hacks. Okay, so that I gave an example of a Facebook group around that boho decor. There's so many Facebooks around that cute stuff. I put a Facebook around that Montessori education, home and, and office decor. You're going to see now because now we're going to get into the part of the actual product research, how making this list then helped me to find where my buyers hang out, what kind of Facebook groups, which helped me to then find products. So something else, um, another way for you to find products, which I've spoken on in the past on my YouTube channel is hobbies. Every single hobby in this world is connected somehow to a product. I encourage you to prove me wrong. There is no hobby that I have found that doesn't somehow require products. And if you niche down, so for example, if you were to look at puzzles, okay, I can see I put a puzzle here. Puzzles have so many niches within there. There's puzzle suppliers, there's puzzle for kids, there's puzzles for seniors, there's like different grades of puzzles, different um, languages, puzzles in different languages, very specific like artistic puzzles. There are so many niches within that and you can do this with every single hobby. So something that you can do is you can go to Google, you can type in hobbies and you can go to Wikipedia. This is just a screenshot of the first half, but there's like hundreds and hundreds of hobbies on Wikipedia. And you can learn about a whole bunch of, of, um, of hobbies that you never knew existed, which could then help you to, you know, do product research, keyword research, and see if there is anything, any opportunities in that, um, on Amazon. Another thing and another great way for a starting point to find products is through careers. So if you make a list of a whole bunch of different careers, you see that there is many different niches within that, right? So like um, policemen and doctors and uh, different types of, there's also so many different types of doctors and there's different types of nurses and there's different types of like waiters and Uber drivers and all these different things. And many of them need supplies, right? And a lot of them will go to Amazon to find their supplies and not everything is saturated. There are many niches out there where there's demand and there isn't that much supply. So yeah, careers is another good place. Decor styles is also a great starting point for finding products. Um, so for example, you could come up with, let's just say boho decor, and then your next niching down from that would be, well, boho decor for a girl's bedroom and start looking in different places to get into that. Another thing is also to remember there is um, different type of decor styles, for example, lemon decor or sunflower decor or music decor. There's so many different types of decor styles beyond just like boho, rustic and all that kind of stuff. Whew. All right. So once you have found your starting point, you then want to make a list of all the different people that you or niches that you can sell to. Okay, so for example, if we take the yogurt as an example, 
if I ask myself, okay, so if I want to sell yoga products, what kind of products can I sell and who can I sell them to? So for example, can I sell them to men? And if so, could I focus on a specific type of man? Okay, can I sell them to women? And if so, could I focus on a specific type of woman? So could I make yoga mats? Obviously like pretty saturated niche and it depends. Okay, so you'll have to go in and look into that. Uh, on, 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 you need to find really sub niche to make it work. But could I make, for example, yoga mats specifically for moms or specifically for entrepreneurs or specifically for women that are pregnant? Maybe they require a different type of mat. Can I make yoga mats for kids? And if so, can it be specifically tweens or teens or toddlers or little babies? Okay, or even better, can I make a yoga mat for mom with baby and it's extra large? I don't know, I'm making stuff up as I go. Can I make yoga mats for seniors? And if so, can I focus on a specific type? Um, yoga products for people with disabilities. Yoga products specific, I don't really think religion fits in here, but also religious. So an example for a typical product that could then focus on a specific religion could be if you take a clock, uh, an alarm clock, and you make a specific alarm clock that reminds you when to pray, for example, okay? That was just an example. Um, can I make yoga products for pets? Probably not. Yoga decor, okay? Yoga in different languages, etc. So you take your starting point and you ask yourself, who can I sell this product to? Is there a sub niche that I can focus on? And the more you do this, the more you realize that, well, wait a minute, it's not as saturated as it looks because if you focus on these keywords that still have a lot of search volume, maybe it's not 20,000, but it's 5,000 and there's, there's a lot of searches here, but there's not that much, um, that not that many, that much competition then I can build a brand around this and look off of Amazon as well and look at Google and look at um, social media and see if people actually are searching for this as well. And, you know, and this is how you find really exciting niches. And I'm so excited to show you the next couple of slides. So before we get into the slides that I want to talk about on product research, really, really quick update is the um, Amazon's Product Opportunity Explorer. The reason I've put this in here is because I'm not using any tools here that are paid tools apart from Amazon to look at keywords. Okay. So if you don't know about the Amazon Opportunity Explorer, I spoke about it on my YouTube channel. There's a video about it and also on seller sessions. Okay. Basically you put in uh, a keyword here and it helps you to find niches. You can also focus um, filter it down and focus on a very specific niche, a very specific category within that keyword that you wrote. Okay. You can also enter specific search volume and yes, you heard right because Amazon today gives you, if you have access to this tool, you do not need to be brand registered to have access to this tool. You just need, if you can't see it under growth over here. Okay. Under growth, product opportunity explorer. If you can't see it in your Amazon seller central account, you need to email Amazon. I can't remember the email right now. I think it's, I think it's, um, opportunity hyphen explorer hyphen request at amazon.com. I will probably put it up on the screen now if I got it wrong or if I got it right, I'll put it up on the screen now. You can email them and ask them for access because this tool gives you exact search volume from Amazon. Up today, we've only had access to estimated search volume or we've had the search frequency rank um, from brand analytics. And today, Amazon's giving us this tool that gives us exact search volume. So it's a great tool that in my opinion just changes everything. So we don't have to estimate anymore. Everything is exact because it's coming from Amazon, right? Can't get better than that. Um, so you email them, you ask them to give you access to it. They're going to ask you for your merchant token. A lot of people have been put off by that because they think it's a scam. It's not. It really is Amazon and they need your merchant token so that they can know what is your account so that they can open up the Opportunity Explorer for you. So basically what it does, I'm not going to get super into it because I've already got an entire tutorial on it on my YouTube channel. So you can find that. Um, but basically what it does it is it gives you exact search volume for a specific keyword, either in the past 360 days or in the past 90 days. So it doesn't give us in the last 30 days the way that tools do, like Helium 10 and Jungle Scout and Merchant Word and all that. 
but it does give us in the 90 days and obviously we can do the maths and try and, and um, estimate per month what that means dividing it by three it also shows you how many units were sold within that specific niche as well in the last 90 days but i encourage you to use the opportunity uh, to go find this tutorial um, and learn more about that now the exciting part remember i told you guys that i made a list or i make a list for starting points so a starting point for example could be montessori okay so let's just say that i'm really into montessori and I decided that, you know, I'd like, this isn't true. I don't want to make a Montessori brand. I'm just giving an example. Um, but let's just say that I did. Then I would go and find a whole bunch of different Montessori related Facebook groups. This is an example of a Facebook group that has 186,000 members worldwide. Okay, 186,000 members. How can I use this for product research? So I go straight away and I click on media. When I click on media, this is a shortcut way. Obviously you can go to discussion and actually see what people are talking about. The shortcut way is you go straight to media and then all you're going to see is photos. And most of the time people are going to be putting products in those photos right? So every single one of these are photos that people have put up within this specific group. Sometimes when you go through the photos, sometimes you see something like, you know, 500 comments, 20,000 likes, and I'm not exaggerating. It exists, those types of things. I specifically had clicked on this simply because I didn't know what it was. Um, and you can see here, this woman found this in like a garage sale or something, and she bought it. She didn't know what it was. So people told her that it's called a marble run. So I went and looked up marble run on Amazon and I saw that it's, it, it wasn't like hardcore saturated, but a lot of the big sellers there was Nat national geographic. They have their own brand of educational products. Um, but there was so much demand. There was so much search volume around it. And it wasn't just in the last 90 days because of like Christmas specifically, there were people looking for this. And then I used the opportunity explorer tool that I just showed you guys. And then I found that there were so many sub niches within that. So for example, glow in the dark marble run. Not only that, it taught me that there's like this whole entire thing around marbles and I can find niches within that and how I can fit that with Montessori. Okay. I'm not going to get more into this specific idea, but this is just one example. Do you remember when I filled out that sheet? I said that I really, really love cute stuff. If you know me, you know that I'm like hardcore, like girly girl. I love pink things and anything that's cute. Um, and someone brought it to my attention that there's like this whole entire niche called kawaii, which it means cute in Japanese. And there's like this whole entire um, uh, niche around cute stuff. So I looked heaps into this niche and I was like, oh my God, I am the buy avatar here. And then I realized that there's so much search volume around this niche on Amazon. I joined heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of different kawaii related Facebook groups. This one specifically has 75,000 members in it. If I click on media, I found this. Now, this is a pink garbage bag. Yes, it's by Glad, which is a big brand. Okay, but I found this niche. Look at how many people commented on this photo. 66 comments, 163 shares, 1,000 likes. If you go through the comments here, everyone is saying how they need this. They want this, they need it. Um, and it brought it to my attention that like, hey, it's just like a simple bag that has been made in pink. Before I move on, I went to the Explorer tool, the Amazon Explorer tool that I showed you guys in the beginning, and I looked up the word kawaii. You can see that here. You can see it says here, data refers to the past 90 days, okay? In the last 90 days, there have been 384,000 searches with the word kawaii in it. Remember, kawaii means cute in Japanese. 384,000 in the last 
90 days. That's more than 100,000 searches per month. And this is actually at a search volume um, decrease. So it has nothing to do with Q4. It's not because it's December. Okay. It's something that people are searching for all the time. Now, once you find a niche, understanding the buyer avatar allows you to understand the type of products they want. I did a lot of research around the type of people that use the word kawaii, and it's a lot of gamer girls. Now, I'm not, even though I have a gamer chair, I'm not a gamer girl. I don't understand gamer girls that much, but today I do because I went and I found out where do these girls hang out? They hang out on TikTok, on Pinterest, and all these different crazy Facebook groups with so many people in there. They hang out all these different and and Instagram, et cetera. I hung out where they hung out. I learned as much as I could about them and it opened my eyes up to the amount of opportunity there is within the niche. Now we looked earlier and we saw this here that it was a pink garbage bag. Okay. If you were to go to Amazon and you were to look at all the different pink trash bags, you'll see that most of them are frequently bought with, believe it or not, a pink da, 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 trash bag, a trash can, right? Now, understanding Kawaii and focusing specifically on Kawaii, I know that they love cute things, okay? So they love anything to do with strawberries and all these different little cute things. So I said, okay, I could, for example, create, I already know that there's demand for um, pink trash bags. I already know that there's demand for tree, for pink trash bins. I already know that anything pink can focus on the keyword kawaii, right? I can take those two things, make them unique, make them a bundle, and I'm not selling a typical pink trash bag or or typical pink trash bin. I mean, trash can or bin. I'm selling a kawaii, right? Trash set, which may sound silly to you, but if you go and check the keyword data, you'll see, even here, you can see. Pink trash can, okay, the word pink trash can has had 35,000 searches in the last three months. 35,000 searches for pink trash can. And if you go and you look at where these products are ranking, many of those words are to do with kawaii. So if I was to do this, I'm going after a specific buyer avatar. It's kawaii, right? I would be selling a trash can in a bag set, but targeting the kawaii related keywords. I could find many, many different day-to-day products, but make them fit to this type of buyer avatar and repurpose it specifically to them. Remember how I said in the beginning, can I repurpose a product? Can I sell it? Can I take a product that is sold to one type of buyer avatar, focus it on on a different type of buyer avatar, right? And I could build a kawaii brand full of basic products, but they're actually focused on those types of buyers. And I could use the Facebook groups also to help me to launch them. So you can see here 75,000 members for kawaii finds, 43,000 members for kawaii home aesthetics, 9.6 thousand members for a sweet kawaii design. 14,000 members for Kawaii fans, 48,000 members for Kawaii home aesthetics. Is that the same one? Oh, sorry, that's a 43,000. It's the same one there, right? And if, if I was to straight away click on media, like I did with the Montessori group, look at this. These are just images of products that they have. They're just showing off all these different things that they have. There are so many hidden products within these niches. If I was to, I'm gonna quickly draw on my screen, If I was to like focus on these different things that they've got here, right? I can start to get ideas for products. Okay, so I did that and it's part of um, my, one of my product research methods. And I found that I can even take generic products but make them kawaii and focus specifically on that specific niche. So for example, if you were to tell anyone, yeah, I'm thinking about selling, you know, some bed sheets on Amazon. Any like regular person would be like, dude, that's so saturated. And I'll be like, well, what kind of bed sheets? Who are you focusing on? You know, is there a specific buyer avatar that you're focusing on? Because if you were to make, you know, cute little strawberry ones or or um, mushrooms on them or whatever it may be, you can focus specifically on Kawaii. If you were to tell someone, yeah, I sell hang- coat hangers on Amazon, they'd be like, that's so saturated, but you make them pink, you make them cute, you focus on kawaii, it's not no longer a, a coat hanger. It's now a kawaii coat hanger. Now, to 
people that aren't as creative possibly as I am, and I'm not being up myself, I just know that I'm, I'm quite a creative person, okay? This may be a little tough to take in, but go check out the numbers. Go and see how much search volume there is around kawaii decor. Any kawaii related keywords, kawaii bedroom decor, kawaii bathroom decor, kawaii decor in general, you'll see there's so much search volume around this. And a lot of it is just taking products that already exist, changing them up and focusing specifically on that niche. Now I could easily build a brand around this, right? So if you like the same thing, if you were to tell someone, yeah, I'm going to sell a, a laundry bag, they'd be like, oh, saturated on Amazon. But not if I start to now look at, obviously I think that's like Hello Kitty or something, but I could make it suddenly cute and focus specifically on the kawaii related keywords, right? We've got a mirror here. We have a pink safe, okay? Supposedly these gamer girls put like to have, there's so many different pink safes out there. Cushions, right? Making them for kawaii decor, different types of cups, etc. okay? So what I want you to take from this is if you go through the same types of questions that I, I ask in my product research course in the marathon, you go through that questionnaire and you start to go through that list of, of ideas or starting points that you have, sometimes you'll be able to find a specific niche within that um, that there's a lot of search volume around and there hasn't been someone that's really built a brand and focused on that on Amazon. I could build a brand around this on Amazon and off Amazon. This is hardcore social media worthy, right? I could use many different types of influencers in different Facebook groups or in different, um, uh, you know, TikTok and uh, Instagram and Pinterest, etc., um, to promote my products. I could find so many different ways basically to market this both on Amazon and outside of Amazon. So. Micro niching. Sometimes sellers only look at the obvious target market, okay? And forget that there may be a different type of buyer that they can market the product to entirely, which then lowers your PPC, gives you higher conversion. It's easier to market your brand outside of Amazon with visual images, etc., as you know who your buyer avatar is and where they hang out. And it's easy to dominate when building a brand. Now, I have an entire video on my YouTube channel about how to find your buyer avatar and what is a buyer avatar and how to go through and build a list in order to understand who your buyer avatar is. I'll put it up now so you guys can look at it. And that was that. I hope that you found this video useful and helpful. I hope that it helps you to find your next products. Um, and if you are interested in joining my product research and sourcing course, I teach you really, really in depth, way more than this YouTube video, really hardcore from A to Z, everything you need to know on a numbers level as well, market analysis, sourcing, manufacturing, product development within this course. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching with Amazon sellers, um, which includes product development as well. I'll put a link to that as well. If you haven't joined the uh, Amazon FBA Alphas Facebook group, I encourage you to join. If you haven't followed me on Facebook or Instagram, I encourage you to, I try and do my best to keep you guys motivated. And if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do. I'd love for you guys to let me know what you thought about this presentation. Um, and if you'd like to see more content like this, and if so, what you liked about it, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the next video.